All right, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, once more, I want to thank Pastor Burgeon for uh, the opportunity to stand before you all this uh, evening. Uh, if you're there in 2 Samuel chapter 10, the title of uh, my message this evening is David Sends His Comforters. David Sends His Comforters. Uh, his brother, uh, Ricardo, obviously just read the entire uh, passage of Scripture here in, in 2 Samuel chapter 10. What we have here is uh, just to summarize this, this chapter in its totality, and then we'll just kind of uh, zone in on certain verses. We're not going to look at the entire chapter, but just going to look at a few verses out of this chapter here. And just to give you all a summary, obviously we just read through it, but obviously this uh, man here has lost his father. His father was the king of the Ammonites, and uh, his father has passed away. And David decides that he wants to show this man some kindness. He wants to have compassion. This guy is in the hour of bereavement. He lost his dad. And um, as he sent his servants out to basically comfort uh, this man who has lost, his, his name is Haman, he has lost his father, David decides he's going to send his comforters there. Uh, obviously, they mistreat his, uh, his guys, his comforters who he sent out. And ultimately, a war breaks out after this, okay? So that's just a, a quick summary, but um, obviously there's much more behind all these words, and that's why we're just going to dive into the few here. And what I want to look at, let's pick up in, in verse 1, um, and we, we'll start to gain a little bit more understanding uh, here. And in, in verse 1, I want to, if we can break this chapter up into little sections or so, or the area that I'm looking at, I would say... Uh, First of all, when it comes to David and his uh, comforters, I want to look at David is reaching out. David is reaching out. As I mentioned, this is a man who has lost his, uh, his father, and David is reaching out to the guy in the hour of his bereavement. And the Bible says in verse 1, And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Haman his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Haman, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. Now, I want to, for one, just point out a little bit of uh, a characteristic, uh, characteristic traits about David. I'll just zone in on one, I would say. Um, and that's the fact that David is a kind person, right? He's kind because he said... I will show forth kindness unto Hanan is what his objective is. But then not just Hanan, like this is really in his character. This is not just a one-off type thing where he just say, well, I'll be kind to this guy because, you know, his dad has passed away. But if you go back one chapter to chapter 9, you'll see where, no, this is David's character in general. He is a person who is of compassion and he's a person who is, is kind as well because he also shows kindness in the previous chapter. In chapter 9, the Bible says, and David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? Notice these words, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. So notice this, that, well, this is not just a one-time thing in chapter 10 where he's just, oh, I want to show kindness because of this man losing his dad. But then here in chapter 9, he is looking to show kindness unto someone else as well, specifically his friend Jonathan, right? And his son, uh, Jonathan, has a son, as we're about to continue to read and find that out. It says in verse 2, And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul? that I may, notice these words, show the kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, uh, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee, notice his word again, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. 
and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? So we see that, you know, uh, David here, this is just his character, that he is a person who is kind. Uh, we see it in chapter 9 where we have Mephibosheth, who is the son of Jonathan. But then we see uh, the Ammonite, uh, this man named uh, Haman. And he has lost his dad. And yes, we see that David and his character is just kind to him as well. But we see two different responses, though. We have two different scenarios. We have one scenario where David is showing kindness unto this man here. And he is humble. And he, bes and he says, I humbly beseech thee. He, he's so grateful for the fact that David is willing to look upon such a dead dog as I am, as he's saying. He's saying he, he's basically grateful over the fact that David is willing to show kindness unto him. But then on the other end of this scenario, we have this same kindness extended unto someone else. And this man is deciding to just trample on that grace and trample on that kindness that is sent unto him. Both are receiving the kindness of David, yet we have two different responses from them both. Amen. Then not only that, we see that the interesting fact about this all is that David is not a respecter of person. He's just kindness. He's just kind in general. Well, for one, you say, well, what do you mean he's not a respecter of person? Well, because we have one person who is of Israel and we have one who is not of Israel and both are receiving the, the grace and the mercy of David. Well, remember, uh, Mephibosheth is basically, you can say he's of the stock of Benjamin because his dad is Jonathan and Jonathan's dad is Saul, who is of Benjamin, right? So he is of Israel. But then this man, Hanan, who is not of Israel, he's of the Ammonites. And if you, uh, if you, this is a little deeper. You can go in on your own time. But the children of Ammon, if you can recall, they come from Lot. Because Lot and his daughters, when Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed, they do that wicked act. And what comes from that sin was the children of Ammon. So in some form and fashion, they are related. But if you just look at, you know, uh, the nation of Israel versus Gentile nations, they will be considered a Gentile nation, the Ammonites. But yet, in spite of that, you have one man who is of the house of Benjamin, and you have one man who is of the house of the Ammonites, and yet both of them are receiving the kindness of David. David is not a respecter of person as to who, it, who he's looking to decide to be kind unto and show his grace and his mercy unto as a king. <clears throat> David here is a picture of God, right? He's not God, but he's a good picture of God. Amen. That God is not a respect of a person where he's just only showing his mercy and his grace only to this people, only to Israel, and only to the Jews. No, he's showing his mercy and his grace. It is bestowed upon all. He is showing his goodness, his kindness, his mercy unto everyone. Psalm chapter 145, you don't have to turn there. Psalm 145, verse 8 through 9, the Bible says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Notice this, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. So notice that, the Lord is good to all. Well, what does the word all mean? All, right? Amen. That's not a respect of a person. So is God good to the person who is saved and has received his son, Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Is God good to that person who has not trampled on the blood of Jesus Christ, but decided, I want that free gift. I want that blood applied unto my heart. I want that gift. I'm going to receive that gift. Yes, God is good to that person as well. But what about the person who want no dealing with God? Is God still good to them also? Absolutely, yes, because the Bible says the Lord is good to all. So that means even the person who rejects him, even the person who will not hear the gospel, I would even say this, even the person who absolutely just hates God and wants no dealings with him, guess what? God is still good to them. God still sent his son to die for them. 
God is still good in spite of your reaction towards his kindness and his mercy and his grace. It doesn't matter because he's not a respecter of person. So we see this uh, correlation with David, how David extends his mercy, whether you are of Israel or whether you are not of Israel, his mercy is just going out unto all. So we see that David here, David is reaching out. David is reaching out. But then we see Hanan's response. Let's look at Hanan's response. Look at verse 3. If you're still in 2 Samuel chapter 10, look at verse 3. The Bible says, And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. So Hanan's response, when he sees the comforters coming and whatever gift or so they may have bestowed upon him, he chooses to listen to these men who say, you know, David really didn't come to be a comforter. David is, is really here to spy out the land. He really wants to overthrow the land. And when he hears that, he then rejects the comforters. He then decides, well, I don't want the kindness. I don't want the, uh, the gift. I don't want the benevolence that you are trying to bestow upon me. So he tramples upon that kindness that is sent out unto him. You say, how does he trample on the kindness? Well, look closely in verse 4. This is how he tramples over the kindness of David. Verse 4, he does this in three ways. Number one, by making a mockery. Making a mockery. Verse 4 says, Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards. Let's stop there. Here's the mockery. Walking around with half of a beard. Now, I, I, I'm going to be honest tonight. I actually thought about coming in with half of a beard. And I guarantee, I just wanted to do it just to be like, you know what? I'm sure because this is all about mockery. I'm sure I would have stood up here and they were, you guys would have been like, what in the world is going on? This guy has half of a beard. What is going on? And what would you have done? Laughed at me, laughed me to scorn me like, what are you doing? Well, that's exactly what, <laughs> amen, yeah, right. <laughs> You would have laughed me to scorn, right? So the thing is, that's what the king wanted to do here. He shaved off one half, a half of, of their beard, pretty much. He just cut off. Now, just think about it, man. If, if you walk out the house one day, you get ready to walk out, and you have half of a beard, what would your wife do? She'd, she'd stop you and say, what, what are you doing? Like, who does half of a beard? Right. So and if all the men decided, guys, we're going to come in with half of a beard today. Right. <laughs> Wouldn't we all get mocked Wouldn't we all get. I mean, who? I think Brother Lindsay has the, the biggest beard around here. <laughs> so imagine if he has half of a beard. It will be a mockery. Right. So this is what what the, uh, the, the, the king here, Hanan, this is what he wanted to do, make a mockery of these guys by cutting off half of their beard. And, you know, that is a mockery. And you ought to be mocked for walking around with half of a beard. It, it's either you have the beard or you don't, okay? Don't walk around looking confused, saying, I want the beard, but I don't want it. it it's not a good look. It's really, you know, it, it's just really weird. To walk around with half of a beard. I should have did it today. I, I should have came in with half of a beard. But then, not only that, I just think about, I couldn't help but, but touch on this. Because this really just something that came up in a culture like a few years ago where this hairstyle that is really worn by women 
where uh, for some reason, I'm just going to take a stab at it and say it came from like Hollywood or maybe some entertainer, some actress, some musician or so, where they would have like long hair on the left side, they whipping their hair around and everything like that. But then on the right side, it's just smooth. It's just shaven. And it's like, what do you want to do? You want to be half man, half woman? It, what's the agenda here? And, and women just started to catch on and just, hey, this is the style now where you got half your head shaven. Well, I know you may think it look cute, but it's really not. And, and it's really a, a shame for one because her hair is given to her, what, for a covering. It, it's her glory. So you cutting all that glory off and you're trying to look like, you know, like a tennis ball or something like that. You know, so <laughs> what, what are you trying to do here? So it, it's not a good look and you ought to be mocked for walking around with half of a beard and a half head of hair as well, as well. But this is how he's tramping on, you know, just, just putting these guys to shame, one of them is just, you know, just uh, putting these guys to the, to the mockery, to the fullest by cutting off half of their beard. Just imagine me just here with a half beard. But then not only just the mockery, but then he wants to also put them to shame as well. Notice verse 4 again. Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks. Okay, let's stop right there. We see the mockery with the beard, and then we see the shame right here, where they say, hey, let's, let's shave these guys' beard off, but just stop halfway, and then let's cut down their garments all the way down to the buttocks. Well, what is that about? Well, they want to put them to shame as well. They want to expose what is called their shame. Turn with me, hold your spot here, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 20. Isaiah chapter 20, this is a prophecy against two nations, uh, Egypt, and then also against Ethiopia. And if you look at uh, verse 1, the Lord is using Isaiah here, and he's going to use Isaiah as an example. Verse 1, Isaiah chapter 20 says, In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, like as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three, three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot. Notice this, even with their buttocks uncovered, notice this, to the shame of Egypt. So we see here that the buttocks being uncovered is considered shame. So we see that the king here knew exactly what he was doing. He's like, uh, we're not just going to make a mockery of them by cutting off half of their beards, but then we're also going to put them to shame by cutting pretty much a hole in the middle of their garment, exposing their buttocks, as well. And we see that the Bible calls it here, just in case, you know, we're just kind of confused on, well, well, is buttocks, is showing your buttocks a part of it? Is it really naked or so? Well, the Bible says here, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. So naked and barefoot is synonymous here in this context here with their buttocks being uncovered. And the bottom line is that when the buttocks is uncovered, the Bible says it's shame. It's shame. And, you know, I just think about the culture that we live in 
that there's a lot of shame that's just going on. Now, listen, I have nothing against women, obviously, right? I'm married to a woman, right? But there, there are some things that I'm sure you can see that men do that are not, you know, are not modest. It's not right. But then you could see where, you know, and you could call that out. But then we have the culture today where, where women are often just showing their buttocks. And, and it is the style. I don't know what you call these little silly shorts today where they stop right where the cheeks is or so and the bottom of the buttocks is out. Here's the bottom line. Your buttocks is showing that is shameful. Amen. That is shameful. And, and it's nothing to be looked at like, oh, it's, gl it's glamorous. Oh, this is the fashion or so. It stops right here. No, it's just shame, man. And, you know, the world will look at this and say, no, I'm, I'm covered. But, yeah, I got the bottom part, you know, but I'm covered up top. It doesn't matter. If we see anything, it is considered your shame. And we need to be mindful about that. You know, you go to the beach or so, uh, what do they say today? Oh, bikinis or so. Oh, yeah, well, I'm partly covered. If the butters is showing, doesn't matter if you had on a bikini or so, whatever. Nakedness is nakedness. Shame is shame. Buttocks out is a shame. Amen. So we see, if you go back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10, the agenda here is to make a mockery of them. The agenda here is to then put them to shame. But then here's the third way how the king here is just you know, just stamping all over the kindness of David by putting his servants to a mockery and a shame. Not only did, not is it just mockery and shame, but then it's public shame as well. He wants to shame them publicly. You say, how is that? Well, look at verse 4 again. Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle. Notice this here. Even to their buttocks and sent them away. Where's the public shame at? And sent them away. Notice that if you look at verse 2, the end of verse 2, the Bible says, and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So where were they before? In Israel. But they have traveled, they have journeyed publicly to the land of the Ammonites. And now he's sending them away. And who, who are they going to come across? The public. So they're publicly walking home with their shame being, being seen. With their buttocks out is how they're headed home. And, you know, you have to be mindful of this. Yeah, this is public shame because you have to just imagine as they're traveling to the land of the Ammonites, if they're traveling along some byway or so or some little highway or so by foot, don't you think they'll come across people, hey, how you doing? Other, other, you know, travelers, hey, how you doing that, sir? How you doing that, man? They're going the opposite way. They may be passing up people or so. The bottom line is that they're in the public. So when they traveled there to Ammon, they had their full beards. They had their full clothing. But now they're traveling back with half of a beard and their buttocks out as well. And if you can imagine... Here's the public shame. Just imagine walking past those same people on that same road now with your buttocks out with half of a beard. And you can imagine, they, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what shame? How can you travel like that, half of a beard and, and covering the public shame? That was the agenda for this as well. And we see the response from Hanan where he's just stamping, trampling all over the comforters by putting them to mockery and shame. And let's just have a, a quick insert here. Let's understand that that is the goal of the world, to put God's comforters, his servants, to put them to shame by any means necessary. And we as Christians, we have to make sure that we don't help them out. They're already trying to debunk the word of God. They're already just trying to find a way to make us look stupid and, and you know, put us to shame in any type of way that they can. We don't want to aid them in that. 
So that's the, the goal of the world is just like Hanan, make a mockery of Christianity. And you know what? Churches does not help this at all. When you got, you know, just Christianity that is not biblical, when it's trying to look like the world, I'll give you a good example. Here's a good mockery. Christian rap. I mean, just think about the title. Christian rap. I'm going to tell you now, I'm not a big fan of Christian rap. You know, don't judge me when I say this, but here's the thing. I would rather listen to an authentic rap song before a Christian rap song any day. Can I get a witness? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but I see some heads nodding before I even finish. Like, you know where I'm going? Like, yeah, I'll, I'd rather listen to the real deal than some joke, some clown who want to pretend. And, and usually they just, you know, just doing everything that the world is doing. The songs sound just like a, an original rap artist. The church services look just like a kid rock concert or a Metallica concert. So you can't really tell the difference. But it, to me, when you look at the Christianity version of it, it's just a mockery. Like, what are you doing? And, and it's, it, to me, is is not appealing. You know, now, of course, don't go listen to the real rap music, right? I mean, I would say just trash it. Just trash it, right? But just because you put the Lord Jesus' name in a Christian rap song does not make it gospel. Right, right. It does not make it, you know, oh, this is a biblical-based song. Oh, and it sounds just like a, a Beyonce song. I mean, why don't you just go listen to Beyonce? But don't do it. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's the mockery that goes on. And, and that's the shame that Christianity brings on itself when you're trying to look like the world, when you're trying to make music like the world. You make a mockery out of, you, out of yourself and, and you just really put to shame. But we see Hanan's response. He's not willing to receive David's kindness and he just treats them wrong. But not only that, we're going to see then David's response. Look at verse 5, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. Verse 5 says, When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. So David sends to his men, and you have to understand, two, uh, here's a couple reasons why David tells them to turn into Jericho. Well, for one, what about when they enter back into the land of Israel? Aren't their own people going to make a, a mockery out of them? Aren't their own people going to see their shame? So he's telling them, well, don't come into Israel, turn into Jericho. So that's one reason that they should turn into Jericho. But then here's the, the main reason I believe that they're sent into the land of Jericho. If you can recall, Jericho at this time is not inhabited. Jericho is destroyed at this moment. If you can remember, it is when Joshua and the Israelites, when they cross over the Jordan, the first city that they encounter is, is what? Jericho. And they walk around the town, you know, seven days. And then, you know, seven times on that, on that seven day, they blow the trumpets. And then they, they destroy the place. When that place is destroyed, turn to, uh, turn to Joshua chapter 6. When Jericho is destroyed, it is never to be inhabited again. And at this time, David, when David is on the throne, it has been destroyed already. If you look at verse 24, Verse 24, Joshua chapter 6 says, and they burnt, this is talking about Jericho, and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Let's jump down to verse 26. It says, and Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, 
and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So at this point, when Joshua is alive, of course, David comes, you know, some years later. When Joshua is alive here, they destroy the city, and he put a curse on the city, and he burns the city. So at this time, when David tells his servants to turn into Jericho, it makes sense because there's no one there to make a mockery of them. The city has been destroyed. No one is there. Now, later on in the lineage of the kings, uh, in the days of Ahab, there, ra- there rise up a man named Hiel who decides that he's going to rebuild the city. And I'm not going to turn there for sake of time, but you can uh, look that up in 1 Kings chapter, six, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 33 and 34. You'll see where that city was actually rebuilt it. And um, it was rebuilt, excuse me. And uh, they set up the foundations thereof. And they set up the gates of it and everything. But at this time, when the, when the servants here have been mistreated, David tells them to turn into Jericho. Jericho is not inhabited. So that's why it was a wise decision to prevent mockery and their shame being seen. It was a wise decision of David to turn them into Jericho because it's not inhabited. So still dealing with David's response, we see David's recompense as well. David's recompense. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 10. Look at verse 6. It says, and when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rahab and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maacah, 8,000 men, and of Ishtob, 12,000 men. We're seeing David's recompense. You say, well, how do you see the recompense? Well, it speaks about how they stank before David. What does that mean, they stank before David? It means they did something wrong. They didn't, they didn't tick David off pretty bad. They have uh, made David mad, and now he's about to unleash his wrath. Basically, think about this. David has sent his comforters. David recognizes that somebody needs to be shown some compassion. He sends uh, an, an act of, of mercy and, and uh, thoughtfulness, and he's extending his kindness. He's reaching out to people, and they are deciding, we don't want that. We don't want anything to do with you. We don't want anything to do with your servants. And David now is upset because you decided you want nothing to do with his servants. He is calling. He is helping you. He's trying to. And you're saying, I don't want you. And what other choice does David have? When you have mistreated his servants like this, when you have put his comforters to shame, what other choice does David have right now? The Bible says they stink before David. David here, and because Brother Ricardo read the entire passage here, we've seen that basically a, a war breaks out. A war breaks out, and before that war, Ammon decides that they are going to hire the Syrians to help them fight in this battle. The Syrians are put to the worst. They get slaughtered. And this battle here, this is a significant battle because, unfortunately, this is a battle that had a a big deal to do with David's downfall. Because here in chapter 10, this battle actually takes place in one part of a year, and it goes into the next year. It's not just one battle that's just quick, but it takes place, it starts in one part of the year and continues to the next year. And this battle, this is the battle where David did not go out to fight, but he actually decided to stay back. Well, this is the battle where David fell into that adulterous act with Bathsheba. The result of that was basically the start of what, what kicked off with the Ammonites. We're in chapter 10, but look at the very first verse in chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 1, chapter 11, 2 Samuel says, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And notice the name that come up here. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So this this battle here is really significant in David's life. This battle kicks off because of how they mistreated his servants. But this is also the battle where he decides at the turn of the new year, yeah, we started fighting a couple months ago or so, but now it's a new year. David said, I ain't going to fight. I'm going to send Joab out there. And he falls into 
adultery. So that's just something to catch on here as well, how, you know, this was a, a crucial battle in his life that he should have went and fought because of how they mistreated his servants. <clears throat> but turn to Matthew chapter 22. This is the last place we're going to turn. Matthew chapter 22. When studying this out, how David sent his servants, he's looking to show and extend mercy, extend some compassion unto someone and they decide that they're going to mistreat and just reject his servants and reject that comfort. And then a war breaks out because they have rejected. When we look here in Matthew chapter 22, we're going to see pretty much, I'm not going to say this is like word for word, everything we just read in 2 Samuel. But when we read this, you're going to see some similarities that sound just like this situation that David was going through here. And I, I just wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ was, as he was, you know, teaching this here, as he's teaching this parable, I'm wondering, uh, you know, just me and my thought, I wonder if he's thinking about David, because it's, it's really close when we read this here. Look at chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. The Bible says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. So first of all, we see where the Lord is saying this king sent his servants and, and these servants were not received. The people would not come. Look at verse four. It says again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. What is that? They made a mockery of it. They made jokes about it. But then we just see the, the men of Hanan, how they made a mockery out of David and his servants, how they made light of it, and they shaved off half their beard and cut off their, their garments down to their buttocks. They made light of the fact that someone was extending their grace unto them and calling them in. The Lord Jesus Christ says here, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant, notice this, took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Well, notice that connection there. The remnant of those people took his servants that he sent out unto them, it said, and entreated them spitefully. What does that word entreated them spitefully mean? It means that they treated them cruel. They were mean to them. They were nasty to them. They were hateful towards them. They were spiteful towards them. They were unkind. They were malicious toward them. The Lord Jesus Christ said they were spitefully treated here. Was, was not David's men, were they not treated spitefully? Were they not treated maliciously and, and made a public shame? Same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ here, it says, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But notice verse 7, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. Then the Bible says, if you still have your place there, in 2 Samuel chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 5, when they told it unto David. So what is it? David heard. What did the Bible say here? He sent to meet them. Actually, let me jump down to verse 6. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David. What is that talking about? He's angry. He's ticked off now. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say here about this king here in verse 7? But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And look how the king responded. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers. Wait a minute. What did David do in the other chapter, chapter 10? Didn't he muster up his army when they mistreated his servants? What did he do? He gathered his army and they went out and fought against Ammon. And notice what the Bible says here. Jesus said, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, the, the battle that David was supposed to go to, 
Notice that the end of that verse says, and they destroyed the children of Ammon. What did the Lord say? That king sent his army and they destroyed those people. Just a connection I want to tie in there because I thought it was, it was interesting between those two that David has a situation where he sends his servants out and they're mistreated. He gets full of wrath and decides I'm sending my armies and the Lord Jesus Christ gives a parable of that very same, very close in nature, very similar. I'm not saying it's word for word, but we see some similarities there. Here's a closing thought. Closing thought. You say, well, what does this have to do with me? Because nobody shaved off half my beard. Nobody cut down my, my, my garments to the middle of my butters. Nobody put me to public shame like that. Well, what does this have to do with me? Well, one thing you can take, you don't take anything from the sermon, take this here, that it is inevitable that in spite of you looking to be kind unto people, not everybody will receive your kindness, as we see with David. You can try to be kind, you can be compassionate with people, you can be patient with people, but you have people who, just like Mephibosheth, will be grateful, will say, thank you so much. Thank you for thinking of me in the time of my bereavement. Thank you for thinking about me when I lost my loved one, just like, you know, Hanan did. He didn't do that. Mephibosheth is, is grateful, and he's humbly receiving the gifts and the mercy that is bestowed upon, upon him from David. But understand that there will be people like Hanan where you are trying to be kind to people. You are trying to do good to them. Here, here's a good example. I, I take a simple example that we all can probably you know, just kind of uh, agree with. Just think about soul winning. Is that not a, an act of compassion? Yeah. Is that not an act of kindness? Yeah. Where you're saying it's about 100 degrees out here <laughs> in Georgia. Amen. And you're saying I'm willing to loosen up my tie <laughs> and sweat out my shirt till my armpits become sweaty and it starts showing through my shirt. I'm willing to have sweat dripping down my face all to save you from a burning hell. And what do people do? I don't want that. They're mistreating you. They're slamming the door in front of you. They're trying to put you to shame with, with scripture. They, they're twisting scripture around. They're trying to pick a fight. They're looking to put you to shame and make a mockery out of you, saying that you don't know much about the Bible. But you're looking there to be compassionate. You're looking to you know, extend some mercy unto them. But not everybody will receive that kindness. You have people who will be just like Hanan and say, I don't want it. But yet you do have those who understand that, man, I'm on my way to hell. This person decided to come and spend 15, 20 minutes of their day and, and teach me the word of God so I can be saved. You have many people, I'm sure at the end of it, where a lot of people say, man, thank you so much for that. I needed that. Man, I have so much joy right now. You have people who would be like Mephibosheth and be grateful for that. But understand that it is inevitable that you will have people to just trample on your kindness. And when that happens, regardless of the fact, whether it's, you know, soul in it or maybe it's just a coworker at, at work, whether it's your neighbor, you're looking to be kind, and, and someone just decides that, you know what, uh, this guy's a jerk. I'm just going to do him like this, and they treat you wrong. They're spitefully. They treat you uh, spitefully. You know what? Here's the thing. Just keep this in mind, that you're in good company. You're in good, in good company. You say, how was that? Well, they did the same thing to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Yeah, so if, if they did it to Jesus, well, you in, and they're doing it to you, well, you're in good company then. You're, you're not alone, right? The Bible says, the, the Lord Jesus says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of the household of faith? Excuse me, it didn't say household of faith, excuse me. How much more shall they call them of his household? Excuse me, right? So are you of the household of the Lord? Are you saved? 
Well, guess what? If they called him Beelzebub, well, you in good company if they're doing it to you because they did it unto him. He says, if the, if the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. You're in good company. You're in good company. So here's the last verse I'll leave with you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Just because people treat you spitefully and just trample on your, your kindness, I like what the Bible says here. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. It was that verse I was thinking about. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Remember we read Psalm chapter 145, verse 8 through 9, and the Lord said that the Lord is good to all. Does that mean he's good, like I said, to the, the sinner who is saved by grace? Yes, he's good to him. But he's also good to those who are, are not willing to receive him. He's still good to them. He still wakes them up every morning. He still feeds them. They're probably still in a place of, of living. They, they have clothing. They have a job. Though they may not recognize him, God is still good to them as well, in spite of them treating him spitefully. So what do we do with this? Do good unto all men. All men. I like how he ends it off here, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Well, couldn't you have some church hurt? People who may hurt your feelings in a church. Doesn't that happen? You know, we are, it, it, we who are saved, you know, we are, we, we are the family of God. And you know what family does? Someone tell me, what do, what do family do? They hurt each other. They fight. Right? Siblings fight. I have to deal with it in my household sometimes, pulling them apart and everything like that. It, it, it happens where siblings want to fight. But you know what's funny? When, when siblings get done fighting, they're back. You're my best friend. I love you. It, it happens like that. Everybody's their best friend. Everybody. They change best friends all the time. That's what, what kids do. But they're, they're family. And guess what? At the household of faith, you know what will happen? Whether it is, you know, and, and I'm just going to lean on the side where people do it ignorantly where someone does not intentionally try to hurt you, where well, it could be an act where someone's trying to be kind, and you know what, they trample on your kindness. But what's your reaction? What should it be? Do good unto all men, especially them that are the household of faith. Amen. So, you know, we just learned that from David that, yes, be kind, but think it not strange when people just take your kindness for granted. Don't think that's strange. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we... Thank you for your word here. Thank you for um, this great lesson here with, um, with David sending his uh, servants out looking to have some compassion, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we be people of compassion and be patient with one another. Lord God, forgive us, Lord, if we have offended one another. And, and pray, Lord, we pray that if we have offended one another and if we have um, it mistreated someone and, and was mean to someone that, Lord, we not be in bitterness about it, but, Lord, that we, you know, go to that person one-on-one -on -one and, and speak with them, Lord God. Let us not be people who are in bitterness or anything like that, Lord God. We thank you once more for your word and pray that we continue to glean from it and read it and, and grow. In your son Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.